Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, this is one of those messages that should apply to you. And if it doesn't apply to you, it will apply to you. Uh, you know, sometimes the Lord gives us messages just to exhort, and sometimes to edify, sometimes just to exalt Him. And then sometimes He gives us messages right where we live to, to help us. And, uh, you know, there's just some, sometimes the Lord just kind of gives us a balm of Gilead. to just kind of soothes us and help us. You know, the Bible says he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities, yet was he without sin. Sometimes you go through things you think nobody understands. That's wrong. The Lord understands. Amen. And sometimes he gives us messages to let us know he understands and tries to help us uh, where we are. You know, it's a wonderful thing about heaven, but that's where we'll be. And it's wonderful to know that we've been forgiven of our sins. That's where we was. Yeah. 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 But sometimes we live in the nasty now and now, and sometimes we face things, and sometimes uh, uh, we have to endure some things, and sometimes we wonder. Do you ever just catch yourself wondering, does the Lord really hear when I pray, or does the Lord really care? And, uh, and sometimes He gives us messages like this one tonight to let us know He does care. He does hear, and He knows what we stand in need of. And I don't know, right in the middle of a revival vein, and we've been plowing, I understand that. You know, the other day my wife said, are you going to be nice today? <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, we've been plowing. And, and I still had not got over last Wednesday's message as one. I had not got over that message yet. Uh, and, you know, but for the last three days, I just, had, I, I just had a thought on my mind, just a thought. It just weighed heavy. And, and this morning I got in the office and, and the Lord began to reveal this this thought bring it to fruition. So I trust and hope it will be a help to us tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll begin our reading verse number 8. The Bible says we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Hallelujah, Brother Steve. Hmm? Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now, just flip over to a few pages to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's look down at verse 24. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the church at Corinth, is sharing a little bit of his insight with us, some of his personal experience. Look what he says. He said, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. That means he was in the water for a day and a night. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak, and am I not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. Let's pray. Our Father, 
We certainly want to again tell you we love you. We thank you for the good singing. We thank you, Lord. We're not a hopeless case tonight. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I do believe all of it. I believe the whole Bible, the whole counsel of the Word of God. Lord, don't understand it all, but I believe it all. And Lord, I'm thankful for those things you've proved out in my life. And Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we come now asking for that special grace. We ask for the next few minutes that the sweet Holy Ghost would be allowed to minister and speak to our hearts. Lord, we all face perils and we all face adversities. And Lord, we all have troubles. And Job, you even inspired him to pin down that man's days are few and full of trouble. But Lord, I'm glad no matter how troublesome things might be, I'm glad we have hope and help in the Lord Jesus. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help us, you'd speak to our hearts, and Lord, we would see that balm of Gilead applied. And I pray when we leave out, we'll leave out revived and better for being in the house of God tonight. Bless these thy people. Lord, certainly if there's any in our midst unsaved, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Lord, I pray if there's any that are struggling, tonight they'd find strength. I pray if there's any weak, that Lord, they'd realize you're their strength. Uh, and Lord, I pray that you'd do a work around this place tonight. Be with every request that we've already prayed over. And God glorify your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice some things about the Apostle Paul. I don't know about you, but when I think about the Apostle Paul, I think about the great man of God. I think about the man, Brother Gerald, that God inspired to write at least 12, maybe 13 books of the New Testament. I think about the man, Brother James, that preached all over the world. I think about man that uh, uh, God would use him to plant churches all over the world. I think about a man that had backbone to go against uh, one of the chief, one of the inner circle apostles, Peter, and rebuke him and tell him, no, what you're saying is not right. I think of a man of uh, devout character. But I often, Miss Judy, don't think about the man who suffered. We don't think about the Apostle Paul in that light. Brother Kevin, of all the books of the Bible that he was blessed to pin down that we read after he wrote those while he was in prison, we don't think about that. We don't think about all that he endured and all that he suffered. So I want to give you some insight to, on the Apostle Paul that a lot of times we divorce our thinking from. We, a lot of times, don't want to look upon the hard things or the ugly things or the hurtful things. Uh, we want to look at all the blessed things. Uh, sometimes our eyes need to be open to the whole counsel that we might see the whole picture. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul had been wounded. Look in verse 24 again. said, Of the Jews five times received I... Forty stripes, save one. That means he was beaten. It means he was strung up to whipping posts and with a cat of nine tails received 39 stripes. Brother Mark, they say that the first uh, uh, 12 to 17 would take the flesh off. Then they said the next 10 or so would take the muscle off. And so by the time they got done with him, uh, 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 Brother James, uh, his bones were piercing through. That didn't happen to him once. That happened to him five times. He was beaten. We see that he was wounded. Not only was he beaten, we find in verse 25 that three times, thrice, I was beaten with rods, hmm? canes, and that cane poles he was beaten with. It didn't tear the flesh up, but it sure did bruise it. Hmm? Said once he was stoned, left for dead. You ever been hit with a rock? Can you imagine being pummeled by many of them? Thrown by people with the intent of you not walking away from it. He was stoned. Notice, he said uh, thrice, three times he suffered shipwreck. And a night and a day, he was left drifting in the water, wondering if he'd make it to shore. The Apostle Paul was wronged. Brother Brian, you know why he went through all this? Because he loved Jesus Christ. That's what he was guilty of. He was wronged. Can I say, 
Not only was he wrong, and he was wounded and wronged. Verse 26, in journeys often in perils of waters. Perils. Look how many times it says perils. In journeys often in perils of water and perils of robbers and perils of his own countrymen. Perils by the heathen. Perils in the city. Perils in the wilderness. Perils in the sea. Perils among false brethren. He was uh, uh, wounded and he was wronged by everybody he came in contact with. People that was his own heritage. People that were heathens. In the city, the country, no matter where he went, he was wronged. Hmm? Anybody ever been done wrong? You ever had anybody talk about you wrong? Did you ever have anybody say something hurtful to you? Did you ever have anybody do something hurtful to you? Hmm? So did the Apostle Paul. He was wounded. He was wrong. Can I say this? He was wearied. Look at verse 27. In weariness and painfulness. Do you ever get tired? You ever get weary? You know what the word weary means? It means to be discouraged. You ever get discouraged? Do you ever think, what's the use? Hmm? Do you ever feel like uh, uh, no matter what you did, it was never good enough, and no matter uh, how hard you did it, how much you committed to it, just like the Lord didn't care? He was wearied. Painfulness. He's been wounded. He's wrong. He's wearied. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to be without. Look again in verse 27. He said, In watchings often, in hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, in cold and naked. He's saying there's many times I didn't have clothes to wear, didn't have food to eat, didn't have water to drink. Uh, I was looking for help to come around the horizon. I was looking for some uh, uh, check in the mail, but it never came. He did without. Can I tell you something? The average independent Baptist church, if God didn't pay your bills for two weeks in a row, you wouldn't show up. Most people serve God based upon how God blesses them. Not the Apostle Paul. He went on to write somewhere else. I've learned both whether I abound or whether I'm abased to be content. Hmm? Notice the Apostle Paul had been weak. Look at verse 29. He said, who is weak? And am I not weak? Hmm? He said, yeah. He said, who's offended? And I burn not? Do you ever think, man, I'm so weak I can't go on. And when you're that way, do you ever think, well, other people are weak too? Well, we don't think in that term. Hmm. Did you ever go through something think I got problems? Did you ever think that the man of God never had problems? Did you ever think the Sunday school teachers didn't have problems? Did you ever think the song leaders didn't have problems? Did you ever think the piano players didn't have problems? Do you ever think, no, when we have problems, we're weak. We're like little children. We, we want to fuss and cry and squall until somebody comes and changes our diaper. We don't think about anybody else. We see the Apostle Paul. He gives us some insight because they had been boasting about other people and how other people supposedly had suffered for Jesus' name. And they was putting so much credit in these other people, they took their eyes off of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul's trying to bring them back into focus. He said, whoa, wait a second here. He said, they haven't suffered. This is what suffering is. But yet, I have all the care of the churches on me and I still do what's right. He goes on to tell them. He goes on to tell them in the next chapter, I realize when I'm weak, then am I strong. Because I'm no longer depending on the arm of flesh, I'm depending on the Lord. But we find he's been wounded, he's been wronged, he's been wearied, he's been you know, discouraged, he's, he's been without, he's been weak. Yet in all this, you find the Apostle Paul without prejudice. You do not find him casting blame on anybody. You do not find him doubting the Lord. You do not find him throwing himself a pity party. You do not find him thrown in the towel. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You nowhere in here find the Apostle Paul alluding to himself at all other than the fact that three times he prayed the Lord would remove a thorn in the flesh and God didn't. 
He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul said, okay, that's good enough for me. Hmm? Go back to chapter number 4. I'm going to show you he's without prejudice. I mean, if this would have been the average Baptist today, we'd be squalling, crying, calling Oprah up. Can you get me on the show so I can tell how sad sack of a story I got? Look again at chapter 4. Verse 8, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. He said, everywhere I look, there's nothing but trouble, but I'm not stressed out about it. Hmm? He says, we're perplexed. He said, I can't make sense of what's going on, but I'm not in despair. He said, I don't need to make sense of it. The Lord knows all about it. Huh? He goes on to say, I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. The Lord's with me. Remember what he said? He said, all men forsook me nevertheless. He said, the Lord stood by me. Huh? He said, I'm not forsaken. Huh? Look what he says. He said, I'm cast down. Hey, I've been beat down, I've been whipped down, I've been wronged, I've been hungry, I've been cast down. He said, but you know what? I'm not destroyed. Instead, I've still got a little fight in me. Hmm? Huh? Why? He's always bearing about the in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body. He says, whether I'm on the mountain or whether I'm in the valley, God's still the Lord. And I'm going to serve Him. Hmm? So we see that he overcomes all that befell him without any prejudice. He continually trusts in the Lord. And this is what I want to preach on tonight. I'm going to preach on this thought. The harm of hurt. The harm of hurt. Now friend, I'm not a fool tonight. Everybody in this building, if you've lived any length of time, you've been hurt by somebody. You've been hurt. And I want to tell you something else. If you've tried for 10 minutes to live for the Lord Jesus, you'll get hurt. It's not a sin to be hurt. But there is harm in the hurt. And if you're not careful, you'll let the harm of the hurt control you. And you will not. I have the same attitude the Apostle Paul had. There is a harm in hurt. And before you can understand the harm and the hurt, you've got to understand what causes the hurt. Can I say what causes the hurt is the manner in how you get hurt? Can I say bruises heal? Wounds scab over and scar. But the manner, the intent that caused the bruise or caused the scar, that's where the hurt comes from. Can I say? The manner in which we are hurt, usually we are hurt by people that are friends, loved ones, or somebody that held our confidence or our trust. That's why it hurts so bad. Brother Philip, if a stranger comes up and chews you out for being a Christian, who cares? Like water run down duck's back. But if it's somebody you have a lot of confidence in, it hurts. Hmm? Paul said, my own countrymen. You have to understand, we don't think of this in the impossible. Do you realize he was Saul of Tarsus? Do you realize he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees? Do you realize he was part of the Sanhedrin council? He was one of the elite Pharisees that was on the face of the earth. And he was on his way on the road to Damascus uh, to go to Damascus uh, uh, to do a, a roundup. He was going to round up people like you and I and they were going to charge us. Uh, and if we didn't recant uh, and denounce the Lord Jesus Christ, we was going to be uh, uh, stoned or crucified ourselves and put to death. He was in charge of the crusade. He was wanting to destroy people like you. And on the way, hallelujah, hey, the Lord showed up on the road. He ran into the Holy Ghost. He got gloriously saved. Got born again. He's no longer Saul. Now he's Paul. But something happened. Did you ever think about when he went back to Jerusalem? Hey, fellas, guess what? That crowd that's claiming about that Jesus, they're right. He did resurrect. I met him on the road. Uh, save me. Change my life. He'll change you. Are you ready? Who's lining up to 
meet him. And they looked at him like he had two heads. Thrown out of the Sanhedrin council. His own professor, Gamil, disowned him. Not only that, he was thrown out of every synagogue he went and preached in after that. Hmm? His own family divorced him. Hmm? Can you imagine the hurt? The manner of the hurt is when it comes from friends and loved ones and folks that we confide in and folks we trust. There is nothing worse than you confiding and bearing your soul to somebody and then they go and tell somebody else and they make a mockery of you. You don't ever want to trust anybody else again. Hmm? The manner of the hurt. That's what causes hurt. Can I say what else causes hurt? The memory. Wouldn't it be wonderful when Jesus forgave you of it, you could forget it? Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody come and ask you to forgive them when they've hurt you, if you could forget it? It's the memory. We have five senses. We hear, we see, we smell, we taste, we touch. It's amazing how these senses will work against us. You can be driving down the road and hear a song from 40 years ago and it brings back a memory. One that you didn't know you still had. You can go into a place and smell something and it brings back a memory. Every once in a while I'll be around or something and I'll get a whiff of pipe tobacco and it takes me back to my great grandfather who died when I was six years old. I can hear his voice. I can remember him. All from a smell. And I say the same senses work in bringing memories back of hurt. You can repress it all you want to. But somewhere, somehow, someday, you'll run into something, you'll hear something, you'll think of something. There, there'll be that memory that brings back the hurt. Hmm? Not only the manner of the hurt and the memory of the hurt, but the murmurings about the hurt. Can you imagine what things were said about Paul? Can you imagine he'd go to the marketplace? Oh, there he is. That's the one. He used to be one of us, but look at him. Just hearing people talk. And can I say, a lot of times they don't even have to talk about you. Can, have you ever just walked in a room and somebody be talking or something with somebody else and all of a sudden they stop talking and you think they were talking about you? They probably weren't, but that plays on us. Because we've been hurt. wonder what they were talking about. I'm sure they were eating me for lunch. Because that's how we think. That's how we're wired. And there's the murmurings. And can I say, Brother Philip, there have been times when they were talking about me. Hmm. There have been times when they were talking about you. You walk in the shop and all of a sudden, oh, there he is. Jesus freak, right there. Hmm. Did they even call, call us that anymore? They used to call us that in the 70s. Jesus freak, yep. Call me Jesus anything? You think you're offending me? Nope. Call me Jesus lover? Guilty. Amen. Jesus freak? Guilty. Amen. Hmm? Jesus is friend? Guilty. Amen. Hmm? Amen. Just call me whatever you want to about it. Yeah. Not going to offend me. Hmm? The murmurings cause hurt. I say one of the greatest causes of hurt is the mental anguish. Now listen, I have said this in years gone by many times. Please listen. When you got saved, your soul got saved. Your mind's not saved. And the battlefield, Sister May, 
where the devil taxes us is in our mind. That's why we've got to be very careful when we say out loud things that bother us or hinder us because he's listening. And if you say, you know, Philip really bothers me. Well, he's listening. And he's going to make sure you hear all about Philip every time you can take about it. The battles in your mind and the mental anguish is what hurts most. Well, if I would have just done this, then I wouldn't have got hurt. If I'd have just been able to change this, then I wouldn't have got hurt. And then if I could just do this, it would quit hurting. And constantly it's the battle, the mental anguish in our mind about what it's going to take to quit hurting and you're constantly reliving it and constantly dealing with it. And if you could ever just get it out of your mind, the hurt would quit. Can I say the mental anguish lasts years beyond the bruises, the scars, and even the intent of the hurt. There is a harm of hurt. What is the harm of the hurt? We see what causes it, but what is the harm of it? Once hurt and the cause becomes relevant, one becomes bound by the hurt, controlled by the hurt. The hurt now manipulates you. Can I say they have proven and they've even named diseases after something when somebody is not physically, nothing wrong with them, Brother Brian, but because of the mental anguish they become bound by the hurt and they make themselves hurt physically because of what's going on in their minds. We become bound, controlled by it. There's a harm in that. If the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. If you're not careful, you'll let hurt control you. Hurt didn't control the Apostle Paul. There's nobody in this building, all of us put together in this building, did not suffer the hurt that the Apostle Paul did. But he wasn't bound by it. But I know people that are bound by hurt. They've let the cause of hurt control them. They're bound by it. They can't break loose of it. It's on their mind. and It controls their life every single day. The hurt is in the forefront of their, of their thought process. Not only is being bound to harm of the hurt, one also becomes belittled because of the hurt. By being belittled, I mean they become a person who's full of doubt. They will not trust they won't trust anyone else, and they won't trust the Lord. Can I say, doubt is a sin. Anything that is not of faith is sin. The only way we can please the Lord is by faith. But when we get so belittled in it because of the hurt, we doubt so much, we won't trust anything. Hmm. Friends, when hurt controls us to the point that we won't reach out and trust the Lord, we're really hurting. It's a harmful thing to us. The harm of hurts when it belittles us. When we won't trust anymore. When we just doubt everything. Do you ever just know somebody that was so cynical and wouldn't believe anything? That's a miserable person right there. They need some of them lemon heads. They probably invented the lemon head. Huh? Miserable. Huh? You say something's black, they're going to say it's white because they don't believe anything. Huh? I guarantee you somewhere along their line they've been hurt. That hurt has bound them and now it's belittled them to where they won't trust or believe in anything. They just doubt everything. The harm of hurt is also causes one to become brazen. They become very hard. I've known some hard people before. 
when compassion and the Word of God just bounces off of them. Just hard. Hard hearted. Being brazen, they're not only hard, they become very haughty. They have a haughty spirit about them. The Bible does say a haughty spirit goes before a fall. Hmm? They just have this arrogance about them. Because they, they make their exterior so hard, so what's deep down on the inside will never be hurt again. Hmm? Listen, I don't care how spiritual you are. If you got strung up and whipped one time, like the Apostle Paul did, you'd certainly give consideration and not letting it happen again, and he went through it five times. He didn't let the hurt harm him. Those have become brazen, they're hard. They become haughty and then they become hurtful. They want to be vindictive. They want to hurt somebody else because deep down inside they're hurting. And they launch out and they want to hurt somebody else. That is a miserable person, friends. I've seen people like I've seen people in churches like that. They want to hurt somebody else. Hmm? God help us never get to that point. I say after somebody's brazen, you know, another part of the harm of hurt is it makes people be numb. A benumbed person is somebody who is unconcerned about anybody else. They're just numb to everything around them. They're just unconcerned. Unconcerned about sinners being saved. That's, that's a sad state. It's my bring up this morning service that so we shouldn't be concerned about going out and getting strangers into the church. We ought to get folks that used to come back in. That's what I said, Brother Mark. As nice as I could be, which wasn't very nice. If they're a member of the church, then they should know Jesus is Lord. They profess that. Which also means that the Father is their Father. Which means the Holy Ghost is supposed to live inside them. And if the Holy Ghost can't get them here, I'm not going to spend all my day going and patting them on the head trying to tell them how wonderful they are and how, how missed they are and they need to be here. It, it, hey, listen. I never have to tell that boy right there when dinner's on the table. Huh? Huh? I'm just trying to help you tonight. It is not our responsibility to tell people that should already know what their responsibility is. Right. Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. And when we're faithful to go out and do what the church is supposed to do, didn't he not? The last commandment he gave his, his, his disciples before he ascended, he said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's our responsibility, uh, to get the gospel out. And it's amazing. Uh, when we do what we're supposed to do, uh, the Lord sends us people. Uh, hey, I didn't know Terry Pelfrey from uh, uh, the man in the moon. I didn't knock on his door. Anybody knock on his door? I don't even know if you can get to his house from here, huh? Hey, but there he sits. How's he here? The Lord knew we needed him. Uh, uh, hey, the Lord knew they needed us. Uh, the Lord knew where to send them. Why? Because we was doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, I didn't know Brian Henry uh, Hensley from anybody. Uh, I didn't know Miss Veronica. There they sit. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Clint Ronda Ruby. Uh, hey, Miss Crystal. I certainly don't know her. She's smart. I don't know her. Didn't know her. Never been to one of her classes. Uh, I'm just trying to tell you, when we do what we're you're supposed to do God outdoes us. Are you listening? Amen. Amen. Went on to say this. We can start right here and how, how big a circle you want to draw around Greater Cincinnati. I'll go show you the churches that used to run hundreds and thousands. And tonight they run handfuls because uh, they got satisfied where they were. They just wanted to keep what they had. They quit trying to do what God told them to do. And they're dried up and dead on the vine. You can have that. Go ahead. Go find it. I don't want it. It's everywhere. You can go find that. That's right. I just want to do what God said to do. Amen. Where's this mentality come from? Wow. Tell you what's come from. Somebody, somewhere along the line, 
has got unconcerned. Hmm? When our concern is not about the lost getting saved, we're in the wrong business. It's time to close the doors and head to the house. And if your desire is to keep us at 12 people, you're in the wrong place. We've done went past that. And yeah, if we had everybody that used to and once said they wanted to be a part, we'd already be in another building program. But I also pointed out this morning, sometimes God prunes it back so it will grow. We've had some dead wood around here. Thank the Lord, some of them went on down the road. There's somebody else's problem today. Hmm. Why? Because they was keeping Terry and Regina from coming. They was keeping Brian and Veronica from coming. Brian wasn't even saved, but now he's saved and he's here. What a blessing, huh? Keeping Lisa, keeping Justin, keeping them from coming from coming. Because they were staying in the hand of God. Hmm. I want to tell you, when somebody becomes numb to the things of God, the first thing they get is they get unconcerned. Hmm? Second thing they get is they get uncommitted. By the way, the person who is so quick to tell us what we need to do isn't here half the time. Exactly. Now, I have not used this card in a long time, Brother Steve. I'm going to pull it out and use it right now. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but it's just the way it is. When you pray about it more than I do, when you seek God's face about it more than I do, when you're more faithful to it than I am, when you spend as much time with God as I do and you lose as much sleep as I do, you get the ulcers that I got because of the care of the church. When you're willing to do all that, then you can tell me what to do. Till then, keep your mouth shut. Get right with God. And by the way, I only take orders from Him. Mm. and by the way I just asked people to brag on the Lord and this person didn't brag on the Lord and I told them that wasn't bragging on the Lord that was trying to tell us what we needed to do thank you Holy Ghost Junior you're dismissed I really don't care I miss what the Lord what's our rule? mind the Lord mm. that's, that's our rule but they become uncommitted because they're unconcerned there's numb. And then they become uncivil. They become withdrawn. People that are hurt, that become benumbed, they're uncivil, they're withdrawn. They don't want to be around anybody anymore because they're going to get hurt again. Hmm? And we know the Apostle Paul wasn't that way. Daily, he'd meet in the markets. He'd go to the synagogues. He went to where the people were. Why? He had to tell folks about Jesus. Go read the book of Romans. Paul said that he would himself be a curse that Israel might be saved. In other words, he said, I would be willing to die and go to hell myself that Israel would be saved. Now that's a burden. And that's a man who was beaten with a rod. Beaten five times with stripes. A man who was stoned. And yet he didn't withdraw. See, the harm of hurt one becomes benumbed, they become brazen, they become belittled, they become bound, but then they become bitter. They start blaming God's people, God's house, God's man. They start blaming others for their problems. They start blaming God Himself. God, you're supposed to love me. And Joel said something good would happen to me today, and it didn't. And God, you must hate me. And God, it's your fault. You say, nobody ever blames God. Well, go, well, go read in Genesis. Adam blamed God because of the woman he gave him. Spineless man. Women, that's why we are. We got it from Adam. What can I say? Uh, they become bitter. Now listen. Hurt hurts. It's painful. Paul even said it was painful. Hmm? It does hurt. And there are times you're tempted. You don't ever want to have anything to do with anybody else because you don't want to get hurt. 
But there's harm in that. That harm will keep you from being what Christ wants you to be. So how do we overcome the hurt, preacher? Because I don't want the harm of the hurt in my life. I understand you've been hurt. Let me just see a show of hands. Anybody in this building been hurt? Put both of them up, some of you. Come on. Been hurt. Let me just break it down. Anybody ever been hurt by a Christian? Raise them up so people can see them. Those of you who don't have to raise your hand, that's a blessing. Mary, you've hurt me. Feeling. Can I just tell one on you? I'll just tell one on you. What the heck? You ain't done nothing all night. Don't make you feel sorry for old brother Ray. Old Smiley. Ray's former church, he, he was the treasurer there. And you know, Ray, Ray wouldn't hurt a flea. Maybe, but no, no. He wouldn't hurt a flea. He don't like fleas. He would hurt a flea. Ray, as long as I've known him, I've known him about 16 years. Maybe longer than that. I don't even know. Longer than that. And he's always been the same. He's always smiling. He's always cutting up and kidding around. He's always trying to be funny and he doesn't realize he's not funny, but he, he laughs at it. You know? He's always picked on the kids. He's always done those things. That's Ray. And for church and after church, he's always going to be talking, cutting up and kidding around with it. Well, he's a treasure. Well, he got to talking to somebody after church or something. And the pastor of the church, um, Brother Ray being the treasurer, he wrote the pastor his check after service every week. Ray got busy talking something and whatever and got in his car and drove home. And he got home and he realized he didn't give the preacher's check. So he got home, he called the preacher up. Said, oh, I'm sorry, it totally slipped my mind. I got talking, got doing this, got doing that, and, 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 and I forgot. I'll run it back over to you. He lives a half hour away. He said, I'll run it back over to you. The preacher says, no, that's all right. I'll be out that way tomorrow. I'll just stop by and pick it up. They said, okay, bye. Then the preacher proceeded to go all over the country and tell everybody they was trying to starve him out and they wouldn't even give him his check. And the treasure was the one at fault. You have no idea how goofy that guy is. But anyway. Now, understanding that now, it's amazing that Ray smiles when he comes to church. He was a treasurer around here for about 10 years. I, he was one of the treasurers around here. huh? It's amazing he was ever a treasurer again. huh? That's just one example. And I could go on. I know some of the others that have been hurt. Some much deeper than that. But you can't let the hurt harm you. You don't want to get bitter. You don't want to get bound. You don't want to become that brazen person. You don't want to become the numb, uncommitted, uncaring person. You don't want to be that person. Matter of fact, I want to run from that person. I don't want to ever be that person. But we all can become that person. If we let the hurt harm us. So how do we overcome the hurt, preacher? Well, I'd like to say there comes a point where you'll never remember anymore and you'll never have to deal with it anymore. That's not the case. But you can overcome it. Amen. How do you overcome the hurt? Hmm? Let me just ask you this, Brother Mont. just popped my mind. You ever had any racial slurs thrown at you? Yeah. Hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, but it did. It hurt. It bothered you. Probably really bothers you if you're children. You don't want them to have to face that. And in the day and age we live in, they shouldn't ever have to face it. Yeah. But it belittled you, didn't it? Made you want to throw down. Should. Huh? Huh? Hurt. All face hurt. You probably face some hurt. Riding a motorcycle. Yeah. There's no telling what people thought of you. Yeah. Probably true when they thought. Yeah, yeah, probably was. Still hurt Not though. Anymore, though. Not anymore. No, but it don't hurt. Yeah. That's a blessing. Don't save. Save now. Yes, That's all that matters, isn't it? Yeah. 
And you still got to keep your bike. Yep. Isn't God good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I want to see it too, man. Blum, 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 blum. I can just hear it, man. I just want to see it. He got him a big hog. Mm. Uh, but how do you overcome? In order to overcome the hurt, first of all, it takes focus. The reason there's harm and hurt is because your focus is on the hurt. Do you know, want to know why we still have to deal with the race car in America today? Because that's a focus. Should never even brought, be brought up anymore. I mean, we've got a black man in the, in the presidency. Huh? Should not ever be an equation. But how come every news agency looks for a story so they can bring it up? Heaven help a white man beat a black man. You're going to hear it. But you never hear about a black man beating a white man. Because that doesn't play the race card. It's all about your focus. If you focus on the hurt, guess what's going to happen? You're going to hurt. Hmm? What are we to focus on? Paul said... If there be anything lovely, if there be anything of virtue, if there be anything of good report, he said, think on these things. Now, understanding all the hurt and all the harm and that he was wrong and that he was wounded, that he did without, that he was weak, if Paul can tell us, uh, you've got to train your mind to think on the good things, think on the blessed things, think on the things of good report. That will help your focus get off the hurt. Uh, what are you saying, preacher? We need to focus on the goodness of God. Uh, we need to focus on the grace of God. Uh, hey, we need to focus on the glory which shall be revealed from God. Uh, he said in Romans chapter 8 that the sufferings of this present time uh, will not be worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Uh, we need to think uh, on the good things of God. Uh, and your hurt will start to diminish. Take the very tool the devil uses against you and turn it against him. Your mind. Your focus. Next time one of those thoughts of hurt come, put in a song that glorifies God in your radio. Put your nose in the Bible and read a verse. If you can't get to radio or can't get to your Bible, get to your knees and say, Father, I need your help. And put your focus on Him. If you can't get to your knees, just under your breath, start singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You'll be amazed how the hurt will flee. And He'll embrace you with wings of love, my dear friend, and bear you up. There's a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It starts with our focus. An idle mind's the devil's workshop. The worst thing you can do is get alone and start thinking about your hurt. You're going to throw yourself the biggest pity party. Start focusing on the goodness of God. The second thing you have to do to overcome the hurt is you've got to learn to forgive. The Apostle Paul realized all that he went through wasn't about him. It was about the ignorance of man against the Savior that made him. Sister Marcy, we do know the Philippian jailer did apologize to him. Because he got saved and his whole house did. But I imagine most of his accusers didn't ever apologize. But he forgave them anyway. Forgiveness isn't about the other person. It's about your healing. You've got to learn to forgive people in their ignorance. Can I say most of the time you've heard it, and most of the time it really wasn't an indictment against you anyway. It was their problem. You've got to learn to forgive. For your sake. Forgive. Because for Christ's sake, God hath forgiven you. Then you've got to learn to forsake. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean what James said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Forsake it. The devil puts a thought in your mind, just forsake it. Don't give it any teeth. Run from it. 
Forsake it. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Forsake it. Don't give it any fuel. Forsake it. Forsake it. Crawl up right and smack dab in the lap of the Lord. The devil won't bother you there. Then you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. He's giving you a measure of faith. You've got to exercise the faith. Say, I'm going to believe God's going to help me overcome this. And just trust Him. And then when your faith is weak, ask Him to increase your faith. Hmm? You just got to have faith. Say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but Lord, I'm trusting you to heal this hurt. And just believe that He will. And He will. Man says time heals all wounds. All wounds. No, it don't. The only thing that can heal old wounds is the Lord. And He will. If you'll just put your faith and trust in Him. Again, the opposite of that is hurt. Hurt wants to cause you to distrust and doubt. You've already started this, the healing process by exercising faith in the Lord. You're starting to overcome. And then lastly, the way you will overcome the hurt is to forego. Just run the race with patience. Keep running. Stay in the work of God. Stay in the will of God. Stay in the Word of God. Just keep running. Just keep running. Just keep running. Listen, friend. It won't happen tonight. It won't happen tomorrow. Probably won't happen next week. But I promise you, there is some point out there when you're going to turn around and you're going to look back and that thing that's bothering you tonight, you're going to say, wow, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Yeah. And that doesn't bother me anymore. Good. Because God honors faithfulness. And little by little, as you exercise faith, and as you focus on Him, and as you trust in Him, little by little, He starts taking it away, and taking it away, and taking it away, and taking it away. And one day out there in the future, it'll be gone. You say, well, I'll still have the memory of it, but it won't affect you. You'll not be bound by it. It won't hurt anymore. You'll realize the Lord's in control. And you'll come into this place and you'll say, Brother Doug on a Wednesday night preached on hurt and, and hey, I didn't think it would work, uh, but I just tried to do it uh, and I can testify here tonight, it don't hurt anymore. Amen. You say, how do you know, preacher? Because I've walked this path, my friend. There are things that used to bother me, things that used to haunt me, they don't haunt me anymore. They don't bother me anymore. You say, how, how can that happen? It's called grace. It's called the Lord Amen. is my helper. Yes. One day I had enough sense to look unto the hills from whence cometh my help, and He helped me. Mm -mm. This poor man cried, and the Lord saved him out of all his troubles. Right. I'm just trying to help you. Tonight, just keep on keeping on. Yeah. Just keep running the race with patience. Mm -hmm. Just keep trusting the Lord. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. I'm not telling you to run a marathon. I'm telling you just run the race one foot in front of the other inch by inch, and one day you'll get there, friend. Don't quit on the Lord. He didn't quit on you. If anybody could have ever quit, it would have been the Apostle Paul. He didn't quit. What was the secret? He learned to focus. He learned to forgive. He learned to forsake. He learned to have faith. And he learned to just keep on keeping on. And in the midst of all that, every time it looked like Paul had fought his last fight, he'd said, the Lord stood by me. Remember on that ship in Acts 27? He said, men and brethren, be of good church. He said, the Lord stood by me this night. He said, everything's going to be all right. Hmm? Hmm? When you think you can't handle any more, the Lord will just show up and you figure, Lord, dump some more on me. I'm okay. Because the Lord's there with you. Can I say, Jesus is the majority. Not me and Jesus. Jesus is the majority. 
And He can win any battle you got, friend. And He will win them when we learn to give them unto Him. Just about every person in this building raise their hand. You've been hurt. That's a part of life. It's the harm of hurt that affects you and those around you and can affect the church. What we need to learn is how to overcome the hurt by giving it to the Lord and letting the Lord do work. Maybe revival will break out because the Lord starts exercising that balm of Gilead. It starts healing some hurt. It starts doing a work in us that we don't even like to talk about. And He starts doing something that needs to be done in order for us to move on and see what He has next. I promise you this, friend. By His stripes, we are healed. The same blood that saved you can heal you of all your hurt if you're willing to put your trust solely in Him. Don't hurt anymore. Don't let that harm of hurt bind you down. Brother Philip, I'd hate to see you hurt. i got a friend of mine. Man, when I was a teenager, if there was a revival meet within 150 miles, he's there. I mean, every night of his life, he was in a revival meet. He used to shout. He, made, he used to make you look timid. <laughs> he'd shout. And I've seen him in dead churches. He Preachers say something true. He'd shout, scare them people to death. He didn't care. He had no sense, man. He just shouted. He loved. He'd weep over sinners in invitation. He'd saturate the floor with tears. I mean, he loved God. He loved the things of God. It, it didn't bother him what anybody said about him. He was there to serve God. And a preacher hurt him. For years, he'd go to church. You never hear him shout. Never hear him grunt. Wouldn't see him weep. I see him every now and then now. He still don't shout much. Every once in a while, you'll hear him say a little something. Because that hurt. He's never gotten over it. I'd hate to see that happen to you. I'd hate to see the harm of hurt destroy you. Hmm? Because for every knucklehead that I got that you know complains about something stupid, yeah. just knowing that I come in and if God gives me a message, you're going to sit there and sh- shout and have a good time. Boy, it encourages me. Amen. Makes me want to get in the book. Amen. Just knowing it don't matter what I preach on, you're going to get something out because you come to get something out of something. That's right. That encourages me. I'd hate, I'd hate to see you get hurt and that destroy that zeal you got for God. I'd hate for the harm of hurt cause you to quit praying for your children and praying for other people's children. I hate to see that. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. I know you're going through something. Right? Don't let that hurt you. God's just molding you to make something better out of you. Just just stay focused. huh? I'm proud of so many of you in here. I know some of you have been hurt. I mean hurt to the core. But you're still in the house of God. That encourages me. Keep on keeping on. Don't let the harm of hurt destroy you because there's souls in the balance. There's lives at stake and God loves you. And if He's for you, who can be against you? Tonight, just give it to Him and let Him start the healing process. Let's all stand.